Welcome back, Ant274. My name is Megan, and this is my final project. For my final project, I researched live mascots of American colleges and universities, like the ones that you see on the screen right here. Throughout this presentation, we're going to take a closer look at, the, at these animals that are chosen to represent some universities and the relationships between those animals and the people that surround them. I want to give some history on live mascots in the U.S., and more specifically, the first live mascot on record. Although most people recognize Handsome Dan as the Yale's one and only mascot, there is evidence that Harper the Champion English wore the crown for two years before Dan from 1890 to 1892. Harper was introduced to Yale by student Edgar Sheffield, who had connections to his owner, R.B. Sawyer. There is not much more information on Harper otherwise, though. That's where Handsome Dan comes in. In 1892, Yale rower Andy Graves' dog, Handsome Dan, started to gain fame around Harvard and could be seen as on the sidelines of his owner's rowing races decked out in Yale blue. Dan would even bark and run around very crazily when his owner told him to speak to Harvard. Sadly, Handsome Dan died in 1896, but the Yale's team were said to still have the spirit of the Bulldog behind them. In 1906, a Yale team was officially called the Bulldogs for the first time, and it still remains their mascot today. When starting my research, I questioned why schools have live mascots. Well, CNN asked Emory marketing professor Michael Lewis that same question, and he answered, because human beings love animals. Throughout this term, we have learned that there is such a thing as incredibly strong bonds between animals and peoples. Our pets are part of our family, just like how sports teams can be a major part of family as well. Lewis says that live animal mascots are the focal point for fan community to get behind and therefore can be a smart move on the marketing side of things for teams to make money. These animals chosen to be mascots can seem like they are owned by the entire community and can create a sense of passion and commitment teams that simply people in costumes cannot. All right, now I wanted to dive into three specific mascots and talk about what their lives look like and what they do for their university. So first we have Bevo 15. Bevo is the mascot for University of Texas at Austin. He took the job as Bevo 15 in the 2016 season after Bevo 14 sadly died of leukemia during the 2015 season. To find the next Bevo, it was a Texas-wide search. There was over hundreds of entries of Longhorns, and the audition process was pretty hardcore. It included bringing lots of noise to the ranches that these Longhorns lived at. It could be from fireworks to band instruments and every loud sound in between. Bevo 15 is actually years younger than any other Bevo before, before him, and he can attend up to 40 to 50 appearances a week. Next up is Ralphie 5. She is the Buffalo mascot for the University of Colorado at Boulder. Ralphie does something pretty amazing. She dashes across fields like Colorado's football field and soccer fields up to 25 miles per hour. So Ralphie first came to the University of Colorado at Boulder by a freshman class officer, Bill Lawry. His father purchased and donated the original Ralphie to Colorado in March of 1966. Something really special about Ralphie is that there's the Ralphie Live mascot program at Boulder. It is responsible for taking care of Ralphie and running her across the field. It's a super competitive program that only few college students get to do when many students apply. Lastly, I wanted to look deeper into the life of mascot Mike. Mike is currently the live mascot of Louisiana State University. He is a Bengal Siberian tiger, which is a type of tiger that's on the endangered species list. Mike 7 came to LSU in 2017 at 11 months old after Mike Six died of cancer the year before. The Mike program was started by athletic director trainer Mike Chambers, athletic director T.P. Hurd, swimming pool manager and coach William G. Higginbottom, and law student Ed Labardi in 1963. That year, those four guys got every student to donate 25 cents and raise $750 to buy a one-year-old tiger named Sheck from the Little Rock Zoo. They later changed his name to Mike in honor of Mike Chambers, who is the main drive behind getting a live mascot at LSU. 
When Mike One arrived on campus, he traveled and served as the new LSU mascot for nearly 20 years after that. A really funny story is that Mike Four is the only tiger to escape and be set free on the LSU campus. He was set free by students who cut the locks of the outer and inner doors of his enclosure. Sadly, Mike was later tranquilized and brought back to his enclosure. Other mics were donated and had support from students and even state re representatives created legislation to help fund new mics. Something very interesting about Mike is that he actually lives on campus at LSU, and we'll look deeper into that at a later slide. Although a lot of live mascots share similar responsibilities when it comes to representing their universities, where they live when they're not working can be a lot different. For example, Mike the Tiger of LSU's enclosure has changed over the years, but it has always remained on the LSU campus right next to their Death Valley football stadium that can hold up to 100,000 screaming fans at game time. Mike's home started out as a old steel barred zoo cage in 1936 when he first arrived on campus. It was later expanded to 400 square feet, and in 1983, his enclosure grew to 2,200 square feet. But it wasn't until 2005 the space grew into its current 15,105 square feet, which includes an outdoor area you can see in the picture above and an indoor night house. The most recent transformation of his enclosure was completed in 2017 when Mike Seven came to campus and was overseen by LSU's School of Veterinary Medicine in conjunction with zoo habitat constructor Ace Torrey. The makeover's final bill was $950,000 and was covered by the Tiger Athletic Foundation. I've actually had the opportunity to visit Mike's enclosure on the campus of LSU. It was cr a crazy experience and definitely felt as though I had just ran into a zoo in the middle of a college campus. On the other hand, another example of how these mascots might live is the Longhorn Bevo 15 of UT. When he's not attending numerous events for the university, he lives on a ranch located 45 minutes away from UT's football stadium. It's a quiet place, he's grass-fed and treated really well on the ranch. The ranch is secluded and he is taken care of by John Baker, the former president of the Texas Longhorn Breeders Association of America, and his wife Betty. And it's clear to see a difference in the lifestyle between Mike and Bevo. And it is understanding why groups such as PETA and the Humane Society have been publicly against the containment of live mascots, including Mike. The transportation of some live mascots, like Mike the Tiger at LSU, has led to controversy surrounding the universities. For example, since Mike One joined the LSU family, each Mike has attended games and events at the university. Mike would be taken to home and away games in the small cage that was towed by a car, which you can see in the black and white picture on the slide. Mike would be towed around the university football stadium called Death Valley, which can hold up to 100,000 screaming and passionate Tiger fans. In his early days at LSU, he would be placed in a wooden box to be transferred from his enclosure to the stadium. As the years went on, they eliminated the wooden box but kept Mike in the same trailer cage for 40 years. After 40 years, in 1990, a new trailer was donated to Mike 5. But when Mike 6 became ill in 2015, the school suspended his pickup truck towed trips around Death Valley and have not brought them back since. While researching the lives of these animals, I wanted to see if the situations they are placed in can have an effect on their well-being or mental state. According to the article Sources of Stress in Captivity, written by Kathleen Morgan and Chris Tromborg, there are multiple aspects of captivity that can lead to stress in an animal's life. They state that, whether in zoos, laboratories, or agricultural settings, animals in captivity are limited in their freedom of movement, their ability to re retreat from conspecifics, and from human caretaker caretakers, and their timing and nature of their food and mate choices. Even though mascots like Bevo and Ralphie roam ranches and pastures, they can still feel similar to those in enclosures like Mike. This different lifestyle has been shown to add stress into an animal's life. Traveling or being transported can add extra stresses and anxiety to animals. The animal's reaction to close human contact or handling can be unpredictable and dangerous. To Morgan and Tromberg, it is clear that direct handling is stressful to animals. 
Mascots such as Bevo and Ralph, Ralphie travel to appearances in trailers like these that you can see on the screen. These spaces are confined and li limit the movement of animals. Is the added stress on animals worth game day appearances? Universities should be asking themselves if they are willing to put animals into unneeded stressful situations just to please fans or have an exciting addition to the sidelines. In lecture, we learned about anthropomorphism, which is when people attribute human characteristics of behavior to animals. Throughout my research on live animal mascots, it is clear that those closest to the animals often do this. Anthropomorphism can be problematic at times because you cannot know the mind of another for sure and are just interpreting their behavior. Live mascot program manager John Graves says, we never make Ralphie do anything she doesn't want to do. We all know her very well. She lets us know when she's ready or not ready. He attributes a human-like behavior to Ralphie in a human-like relationship. Although it is good that he believes he has a relationship with the animal, he still does not know for sure what she is thinking. Ralphie will never be able to physically communicate with her handlers and might not show her stress or anxiety in ways that they would expect. Similarly, head football coach at UT, Tom Herman, says, Bevo's steady as a rock. There's chaos going around and he's just like, hey, what's up? I wish I could stay that calm in the middle of that. He compares Bevo to characteristics and behaviors that a strong human might have. Although he can't talk to Bevo, he interprets his behaviors in a very humanistic way. The relationship these humans have with the animals are important to keeping the animals and those around them safe, but it is not for sure a way of understanding how these animals are thinking or feeling, and could therefore cause some unexpected and harmful situations for the animals and people. There is constant conversation going on regarding the criticism that animal protection agencies have with live mascots. Organizations such as PETA recognize that a college campus is not a place for any exotic animal. The environment that they are in is not beneficial to their health or well-being. Even in the best circumstances, subjecting animals to a busy university environment and forcing them into close proximity to crowds of people day in and day out is stressful and cruel. Exotic animals don't get used to being in public spaces. From lectures, we have learned that animals are physiologically, mentally, and emotionally similar to humans. They can feel stress and anxiety in situations that they are placed in. It is important to recognize that the stress and anxiety that these animals can experience will have physical and emotional consequences on these animals. In conclusion, after my research, I believe that universities need to look into the treatment of their live animal mascots more closely. If they believe they must have one, then they should be completely focused on its well-being and eliminating as much stress as possible from their lives. Schools should recognize that a student in a costume can do so much more than live animals and can verbally express how they are feeling in any and all situations. Although it is important that a live mascot's handlers take into consideration the feeling of the animal, they can never really know for sure, which can cause problems for the animals and the people around it. Personally, I believe all schools should eliminate the use of live mascots. I'm glad schools like ours and other schools shown in these pictures have chosen costumes over real-life animals. Thank you for listening to my presentation. I hope you have a great rest of your day.